So I don't have a PowerPoint, but I have a good excuse. So I didn't know I was going to be talking. So Kathleen talked about the fact that good journalism still matters and made a totally undebatable case that it does. In my talk, I'm going to raise the question about do we have good journalism? Do we have journalism that actually does check facts and assumptions often enough? So I'm calling my talk Truth in Journalism. So a while back there was a story <clears throat> in the New York Times about a dispute involving Fox News. And it, the story described Fox News as, a, a, quote, a channel with a reputation for having a conservative point of view in much of its programming. A channel with a reputation, really? So the phrase with a reputation put the reporter and the newspaper at arm's length from the fact that the Fox News Channel does have a conservative point of view and is proud of it. So what was the purpose of this distancing phrase? A New York Times article in 2012, typical of many others, <clears throat> referred to Jared Lochner as, quote, the man accused of opening fire outside a Tucson supermarket, unquote. Now, whether the Tucson shooter, or indeed the 19-year-old in Boston, is guilty of murder <clears throat> is a legal question, but at least in the Lochner case, there's no question at all about his identity as the man who shot Congresswoman Gabriel Giffords and killed six people. We don't have to say accused of. He did the deed in front of dozens of witnesses. I don't mean to pick on the Times, of course, just not just because Jill Abramson isn't here, but uh, it's a newspaper, I, as you heard, I worked for for many years, and I have a very high regard for it. And although it's attacked most often from the right, but not infrequently from the left, for various kinds of bias, I actually do believe in both its performance and in its ideals, it epitomizes the commitment of mainstream journalism to the goals, often stated goals in journalism of fairness and objectivity. And that's nothing new. Adolf Ox, the founding publisher of the modern New York Times, whose byword was without fear or favor, believed that a responsible newspaper should, quote, report all sides of a controversial issue and let the reader decide the truth, unquote, according to a reminiscence written a few years ago for internal distribution to the Times staff. So in this talk, I want to raise some questions about the assumption behind that credo, as well as the utility in this media and advertising-saturated, cynical age of the siren call of fairness and objectivity. Inside the profession of journalism, there's been a lively debate going on for years over whether the he said, she said format designed to avoid taking sides on controversial issues impedes rather than enhances the goal of informing the reader. The importance of the goal, of course, underscored by Kathleen's presentation. This debate comes up most often during political campaigns and the factcheck.org and the, the new norm of really investigating claims made in political debate and political advertising, I think, has been uh, a very good thing. And it would be great if it could be expanded uh, much more than it is outside the world of actual campaigning. For one thing, of course, we live in a permanent campaign, whether it's labeled campaign or not, or whether it involves uh, candidates and elections or issues. For instance, um, just a few weeks ago, uh, a federal judge, federal district judge in New York, uh, Judge Edward Corman, issued a fascinating opinion that ordered the uh, Department of Health and Human Services to make emergency contraception available without prescription to women of reproductive age, including teens without age limit. This has been a very controversial policy matter for a long time. And one reason it's been controversial is because of the claim in the anti-abortion community that the most common form of emergency contraception, the so-called morning after pill, um, acts as a, quote, abortifacient. And you see this claim made in many, many stories about this debate uh, in which the opponents of making emergency contraception available or making emergency contraception part of the mandate under the Affordable Care Act for uh, employer-provided insurance will say it causes abortions. And the stories usually say, they say it causes abortions. 
without any effort on the part of the press to investigate that claim. So what Judge Corman did in his opinion, and it was really interesting, he quoted a GAO report, the Government Accountability Office report, which was kind of a meta-analysis of a number of studies as to what effect the emergency contraception actually has. And lo and behold, it turns out that it actually has nothing to do with abortion. It, the, the mechanism of the hormone that's the main ingredient in this uh, medication is to delay ovulation and immobilize sperm so that egg and sperm never meet, and that's how it works. It's birth control. It's not abortion. This was evidence-based judging that should correspond to evidence-based medicine, and there should be evidence-based uh, journalism. So I thought that was a very interesting example, and then I run my own little fact-check organization. So when I see stories like this, if I know the reporter, I actually email them and say, by the way, even though you quoted people as saying this, um, that doesn't make it true, and isn't there an obligation to say so? And you can quote somebody saying the moon is made of green cheese, and that's an accurate quote, but it doesn't mean that readers should read the story and believe that, well, maybe the moon is made of green cheese. So it's, it's more challenging to question that he said, she said norm in context outside of an actual uh, campaign. Uh, for instance, some people, many people, I think a consensus now, uh, consider waterboarding to be torture, and they refer to it that way. But others cling to the notion that it's not torture, so what is a news organization to do about this? NPR has chosen to use, quote, harsh interrogation tactic, or, quote, enhanced interrogation technique instead of torture when reporting stories about waterboarding and other coercive practices used to interrogate terrorism suspects. When listeners started to push back, Alicia Shepard, who was then the NPR ombudsman, responded that she agreed with the network. Quote, the problem is that the word torture is loaded with political and social implications, she wrote on her blog, adding, quote, NPR's job is to give listeners all perspectives and present the news as detailed as possible and put it in context, unquote. Because using the word torture would amount to taking sides, she said. Reporters should instead, quote, describe the techniques and skip the characterization, quote, entirely. And this debate is currently going on. Uh, and as we all know, language is very important in how to describe uh, those individuals who are in this country without legal um, authorization or documentation. So illegal alien, of course, was a word that was very commonly used at one point, then people news organizations got a little sensitive about the loaded word alien, so they would say illegal immigrant. Uh, others would say undocumented immigrant. Others would say unauthorized immigrant. It's a big debate going on. And uh, I read just recently on one of the blogs that the New York Times is now going toward uh, unauthorized, that undocumented has a, spin, has a loaded spin of two pro-immigrant so we should, say, uh, we should say unauthorized and we should avoid any kind of loaded words. So it's just an indication that people, language has power and how we characterize things in mainstream journalism does have, as I'm sure Kathleen would agree, an effect on public understanding. But the, this kind of issue, the torture versus not torture, is maybe too easy an example because it's binary. Uh, either use the word or avoid the word. How about a complex event or situation that requires the reporter to make a series of judgments in order to describe adequately and assign priorities to such factors as motivation, relationships among actors, or likely consequences. Paul Taylor, a former political reporter for the Washington Post, had this to say in a trenchant book called See How They Run, Electing the President in an Age of Mediocracy. Mediocracy. He said, quote, Sometimes I worry that my squeamishness about making sharp judgments, pro or con, makes me unfit for the slam-bang world of daily journalism. Other times I conclude that it makes me ideally suited for news gathering, certainly for the rigors and conventions of modern, quote, objective journalism. For I can dispose of my dilemmas by writing stories straight down the middle. I can search for the halfway point between the best and the worst, best and worst thing that can be said about someone or some policy or idea and write my story in that fair-minded place. 
By aiming for the golden mean, I probably land near the best approximation of truth more often than if I were guided by any other set of compasses, partisan, ideological, psychological, whatever. Yes, I'm seeking truth, but I'm also seeking refuge. I'm taking a pass on the toughest calls I face. Jay Rosen, a press critic and journalism professor at NYU, calls the phenomenon that Taylor describes, quote, regression toward a phony mean. Joan Didion, way back in 1996, referred to fairness as a familiar newsroom piety, benign ideal that operates, as she said, the excuse in practice for a good deal of autopilot reporting and it lazy thinking. What it often means, she said, quote, is a scrupulous passivity, an agreement to cover the story not as it's actually occurring, but as it is presented, which is to say, as it is manufactured. Back in that same year, 1996, the Society of Professional Journalists dropped objectivity from its ethics code, a development understood to reflect the fact that there had ceased to be, if there ever was, a common understanding within the profession of what objective reporting consists of. A leading commentary on the practice of modern journalism, the elements of journalism by Bill Kovach and Tom Rosensteel, omits fairness and objectivity from its list of the 10 basic elements of journalism. Describe, which they describe as clear principles that journalists agree on and that citizens have a right to expect. Why the omission? Quote, familiar and even useful, as the idea of fairness and balance may be, the very concept has been so mangled, they say, as to have become part of journalism, journalism's problem rather than a solution to perceived problems of bias and partiality. But Brent Cunningham, deputy editor of the Columbia Journalism Review, has observed that despite this discontent and self-reflection, quote, nothing has replaced object objectivity as journalism's dominant professional norm. In fact, he notes a cottage industry of biased police has sprung up, leading to hypersensitivity among the press to charges of bias, and that is true, which in turn reinforces the problematic adherence to a standard of objectivity that can trip us up on the way to truth. Truth. So how about truth for a goal? We may not have a journalism of truth because we haven't demanded one. The cultural critic Neil Gobbler wrote in response to the media's performance in covering the healthcare debate. He noted that by simply reporting the latest guided missile, the media marshals facts but they don't seek truth. They behave as if every argument must be heard and has equal merit when some are simply specious. So why is it just so difficult to embrace the search for truth as a, the highest journalistic value? Well, for one thing, of course, the notion that there exists one truth with a capital T exists in some tension with the core First Amendment value. After all, the First Amendment recognizes no such thing as a false idea, the Supreme Court tells us. The familiar image of the marketplace of ideas suggests ideas competing freely for public favor unvetted, unranked, and unregulated by some superintending power. For another thing, the word truth lacks a single definition. To report without elaboration, a politician's charge concerning the death panels in the health care bill is, assuming that the politician's quoted accurately, certainly to report the truth. He said it. Does such a report convey a more useful or meaningful truth? The contextual truth of the situation? Obviously not but just as obviously it wouldn't require a correction on the corrections page. In the elements of journalism, Kovach and Rosenstiel make a distinction between two kinds of truth, correspondence and coherence. For journalism, those, te those tests translate roughly into getting the facts straight on the one hand and making sense of the facts on the other. They call for a journalism of verification to replace a journalism of assertion. A more conscious discipline, they say, of verification is the best antidote to being overrun by the journalism of assertion. Fairness and objectivity should be regarded as tools to that end rather than as ends in themselves. So I'd like to offer a little case study, assuming I have time or any lights flashing, I can't tell. No, okay. In what I regard as the perils of the journalism of assertion as practiced by our finest newspaper, in recent years, the name David Rifkin started showing up in the columns of the New York Times. For example, in 2006, when a federal district judge in Detroit declared that the Bush administration's warrantless wiretapping program was unconstitutional, Rifkin had this to say in the Times, quote, 
It's an appallingly bad opinion, bad from both a philosophical and technical perspective, manifesting strong bias, unquote. Rifkin was identified in that story as, quote, an official in the administrations of President Ronald Reagan and the first President Bush. There was no indication of what might have given him the philosophical perspective to criticize the court decision so forcefully, or of what evidence he possessed of strong bias on the part of the judge, Anna Diggs Taylor. When another judge ruled that some prisoners held by the U.S. at the Bagram Airfield in Afghanistan had the right to petition for habeas corpus, Rifkin, quote, warned that the ruling gravely undermined the country's ability to detain enemy combatants for the duration of hostilities worldwide, unquote. This time he was identified as, quote, an associate White House counsel in the administration of the first President Bush, unquote. Since that administration had ended 16 years earlier, I wondered what current expertise Rifkin possessed that led him to make such a harsh assessment of this new decision. A check of the Times database reveals that since 2006, Rifkin has been quoted at least 31 times in articles concerning the detainees of Guantanamo Bay 12 times, detainees of Bagram, executive privilege and presidential authority, targeted killing, Iraq, Abu Ghraib, the performance of Attorney General Michael Mukasey, and the CIA and its interrogation policies. The descriptions of his role and his implied expertise varied from story to story, but the quote was always to the same effect, a strong defense of President Bush and his policies. To the extent that Rifkin had any relevant expertise, the basis for it was not disclosed on his law firm's website, which contains a lengthy biography. A partner in the international law firm of Baker Hostetler, he's identified as a member of the firm's litigation, environmental group, and I'll skip all that, but his qualification for practicing law in these areas was not particularly evident. He worked uh, under Vice President Dan Quayle as Special Assistant for Domestic Policy and Associate General Counsel in the Department of Energy. The more I read this, the more mystified I became. An article on the prospect that President Obama might transfer some Guantanamo detainees to the United States included a warning from David Rifkin that classified information might be made public during trials in civilian courts, quote, a danger that David B. Rifkin, an official in the Reagan Justice Department, calls, calls the conviction price, unquote. I should note that his usefulness extends beyond the pages of the Times. In Washington Post analysis of the release of the so-called torture memos included this paragraph, quote, David Rifkin, a lawyer at Baker Hostetler who supported the detainee's policies, says the memo's carefully and nuanced legal analysis produced eminently reasonable results, unquote. I give the post writer credit for identifying Rifkin as a lawyer in private practice who simply supported one side of the issue. Rifkin even showed up in a New York Times culture feature about the documentary Taxi to the Dark Side, which took a highly critical stance toward the administration's interrogation policies at Abu Ghraib. Rifkin introduced to the readers as, quote, a lawyer in the administration of President Ronald Reagan and the first President Bush, unquote, becomes the voice of the other side in an account of the film and interview with the filmmaker. Quote, it's pretty clear that it's not policy and it's pretty clear that these things are prosecuted, Rifkin is quoted as saying. The article goes on. Mr. Rifkin said the military's performance by historical standards has been quite good in the recent conflicts. In all the good wars, we've had some pretty bad records, unquote. How was it that Rifkin emerged zealot-like into daily journalism? I asked reporters who had quoted him whether they had called him for a quote or whether he had called them. And I'll leave out the names of the reporters because they did not expect to be identified publicly. Quote, he reached out, one told me, noting, I've known him for a long time. Another said he'd been referred to Rifkin by a conservative think tank. I called him, another said, I have quoted him a few times in the weird role of surrogate for the Bush administration. It was to the point that Bush administration officials would suggest, would suggest him when they chose not to speak for themselves. From another reporter, I called Rifkin, who's been defending the Bush policy for so long that he knows them as well as the human rights folks. And noting that the article contained criticism of the policies, the reporter said, I thought it would be unfair not to make the opposite point. Well, I probably don't have to tell you what I think of this. I find it particularly troubling to use Rifkin to criticize federal court decisions. When a federal district judge issues a decision, there is no, quote, other side to the story. The decision is the story, it's the decision. The other side is contained in the briefs presenting the arguments that the judge rejected. But digging up the briefs, reading them, and summarizing them takes more work 
than accepting an ad hominem soundbite from somebody willing to answer any phone call. I actually don't mean to be particularly critical of David Rifkin, a man with whom I actually have a perfectly pleasant relationship as a surrogate, as the go-to proxy. He's simply filling a role assigned to him by reporters and, let's assume, by editors who accept unquestionably the notion that every story has another side, that is journalism's duty to present. But there's another side to that story, too, one that calls on journalists, on journalists to do their best to provide not just the facts, but also always the truth. Thank you. So we're both here, and we're both happy to take your questions. Please do wait for the mic, and when you get the mic, identify yourself. Howard Gardner, I, uh, I'll identify you. <laughs> Thank, um, um, Kathleen, um, I think probably I speak for most of the audience in saying that um, you know, your, your presentation is very convincing and very powerful. Um, but there was one thing about the presentation that I noticed, and that is that almost all the examples put the Republicans in a bad light. Uh, and so my, so my question, which, which is a ser serious one, is could you give the same presentation with democratic distortions? And if not, do you think there is a basic difference in, in the way the parties handle uh, presentations and spin? Well, first... The McCain example is an example in which a Republican is disadvantaged by money that is not Republican or Democratic money. It, it's, it's issue ideology money. Uh, the welfare example is an example in which Republican governors are disadvantaged. So who is disadvantaged by this? The governance process is disadvantaged by this. That said, the more recent examples are examples in which you've got something advanced by the administration in some form. And so I, I take the question to be about those. Uh, those that are in power are always going to be the target for this kind of maneuver because they've got the power. This mo recent phenomenon, which is the post-citizen united world, hasn't actually been tested with the Republicans in power. I would expect that those exercising power are going to see those forces that want to influence legislation using this strategy in order to influence them regardless of ideology. I picked the first example, the furlough example, because I wrote a book, Dirty Politics, about it, and as a result, studied it extensively. You can make the same kind of case about some other instances in the distant past, but you have to lay up a lot of other historical information in order to do it. Um, and you, know, you, and you, can, you can go to the Lyndon Johnson um, advertising, for example, against Barry Goldwater. The problem is the deception that is a Democratic deception against a Republican defeated the Republican. And as a result, you don't have a chance to see what the effects would have been on governance of the Republican. But the Lyndon Johnson campaign against Barry Goldwater matches in deception in some key issues. In some key instances, the level of deception by the Bush campaign against Michael Dukakis in 88. I think up in the balcony, right? Terry Shepard from Baltimore. I want to thank you, Linda, for saying the things that I, as a former journalist, have been muttering around my house for years now. Um, and I want to ask about the concept of fairness and how it is tilting the, the, even the fact checkers. I think the, the rise of fact checking is an important development and yet I think they've hurt themselves in two ways. One is when one side is doing vastly more distortion than the other, in the interest of fairness they try to dig up things and, and expand them on the side that is less distorting. In the last election, Romney versus Obama. Many of the fact checkers, and I think of the Washington Post in particular and PolitiFact, inflated especially their Pinocchios and all these silly logos they put on things that oversimplify, inflated the sins of the Obama side in order to try to make up for the fact that they were reporting so many sins on the Romney side. And I wondered if, if what is the antidote to the pressure that makes fairness into we, got, we have to make this equal on both sides? I agree with you. I mean, that's a very important sort of second order uh, part of my analysis, and I think it's very difficult to attack, especially in an age of these public editors and ombudsmen and so on, who act as kind of flypaper for 
cranky or gender-based criticism. So uh, it, it makes it, I mean, for instance, but the best current example, so there's this doctor on trial here in Philadelphia, Gosnell, I think is his name, um, who performed abortions under deplorable circumstances with, you know, no, uh, just horrible medical practice. And, you know, there's a million abortions that take place a year in the United States, and almost all of them are done under proper medical conditions. And so here's one guy who didn't. Uh, not a very significant national story, one would think. Uh, but, so the national media wasn't paying any particular attention to it. So uh, complaints started pouring in, agenda-driven, manipulated complaints started pouring in saying, this is a cover-up. You're not covering this criminal trial. Basically, the subtext was, you know, which stands for the fact that abortion practice is highly problematic and, you know, look what it gets you. So the mainstream media couldn't resist and started covering this trial as if it stands for anything other than one really bad actor in a huge pile of perfectly decent actors. And, and that's an example of how, uh, you know, it's just, it's just hardwired into the, I'm mixing metaphors, DNA of, um, <laughs> in this crowd, forgive me, um, uh, you know, of, of the mainstream media that's very difficult to stand up to a charge of being unfair. Let me respond to the moral equivalence argument because I think it's a really strong argument and it is problematic. But first, let me say something about factcheck.org and how it differs from PolitiFact and Washington Post. We do not give Pinocchios. We do not have a truth meter. We do not think there's such a thing as an equal interval scale between levels of truthfulness that you can actually mark claims against in some way that makes any logical sense. And as a result, we think that when you set those scaling mechanisms up, you're opening yourself to charge of bias and subjectivity simply because you have not set up a mechanism that makes any sense to people on any other grounds. Um, we try, as a result, to write long-form journalism, and we try to say this is accurate or this is unproven. We try to use language, in other words, that we think is more defensible. On the moral equivalence issue, there is a tendency because we all believe our own side does not deceive to believe that when we find things on one side and on the other, we've always disadvantaged the side that we believe is incapable of much deception. And the problem for fact-checking organizations, journalists, et cetera, says we've got those biases too, so how do you protect from those biases? Because if you don't, you're going to run the risk that in order to appear fair, you're going to try to up the other side in some kind of a bizarre fashion. We look at every ad that exists that we can find, and we examine every claim in every ad. Now, sides that are flailing, candidacies that are flailing, are going to offer you more ads. And as a result, the likelihood, if there's the same amount of deception per ad on average, they're going to have more deceptions, is actually high. And so you're going to see, on average, historically, this is true, that the side that is doing most poorly will engage in the higher level of deception, not because they're putting more advertising weight behind any of those claims, but because they're trying to find a message that's going to work. Whereas the more effective campaigns, that is, they're getting traction, will have fewer total advertising claims, hence a lower level of deception, but at higher weight per deception. Now, here's the problem when you say, what's the amount on each side? If we say we're going to look at every ad as the basis for ensuring that we're protecting ourselves from our own biases, then we're going to automatically be checking probably more from the side that is least likely to win than from the side that's most likely to win because it has an advertising strategy that just drives a single deception through all of the way. I am more worried about that phenomenon than I am about the phenomenon of false balance if you start by looking at everything. Same thing with debate claims. If you look at every single debate claim, you're more vulnerable, I think, when you're seeking out some things in order to check across a whole arena. And as a result, you don't have a common denominator. Secondly, I think the problem of moral equivalence can be defined as sometimes we don't judge relative levels of deception very well because we don't really know how you do that. But here's what I can tell you. The most aired deception by the Romney campaign against Obama in the last election that was found problematic by fact checkers is the one I looked at. It's gut, it's gut welfare. The most often, I'm sorry, the Romney campaign against Obama. The Obama campaign against Romney is that he opposed abortion even in cases of rape and incest. I think what the fact-checking community needs to do is to say what's the most often aired of the deceptive claims and find a way within the constraints of journalism, which only considers the new, new once, to repeatedly feature the fact that those are deceptive so that as the ads continue and continue and continue, they don't override the fact-checking. 
Lynn Hunt from Los Angeles. Uh, these were absolutely fabulous talks. I just wanted to add a little historical perspective, since I'm an 18th century historian. When freedom of the press first becomes an issue in the 17th, and especially in the 18th century, the issue is that people were not being allowed to contest secular and political authority. So what I just want to point out is that what we have here is, in some ways, the structural problem of modern democracy, which is it's no longer an issue of contesting political and secular authority. It's a question of figuring out where there is authority, mm -hmm. and where there is authority is in public opinion, and that means that there's a kind of triangulation between supposed authorities, the media, and the people that's inevitably going to be filled with incredible amounts of tension and the attempts to manipulate precisely what public opinion will be. And this is why your talks are so wonderful, because they point out not just the subtleties, but the kind of moral and political issues that we all have to constantly be thinking about in this kind of environment which we have come to be in. Thank you. Thank you. Up in the balcony. Barbara Gross, uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. I wonder if you would uh, comment on these issues of balance and presenting all sides as they arise in reports on scientific issues and um, w many of which do then have policy implications. So there seems to be in the press a great deal of uh, thought that they have to present both sides equally on issues like global warming or whether vaccinations cause autism, as though there were no fact of the matter. And of course, the second, uh, Linda, you mentioned various abortion cases which uh, fall in the same arena. Uh, particularly troubling to me is the press's use of the word believe in those contexts as who believes in evolution and who doesn't, as though there were no fact of the matter, there was no notion of truth in science either. So, um, and, and related to this is journalists' responsibility to actually understand something scientific before they report on it. <laughs> Wait, that touched a nerve, Barbara. Um, <laughs> how much you understand various issues before you report on them, Linda, I thought I would ask. Yeah, so, I mean, obviously your, your point is well taken, and, and uh, there may well have been, you know, journalism literature studies on the climate change, quote, debate. Uh, I think most of the mainstream has come around uh, on that, but it was a long process, and there will be other things. I mean... When you talk about the responsibility of journalists, I always take it up one level and talk about the responsibility of editors and publishers uh, to be willing to hire and pay for and give space to uh, you know people with with the right credentials. And uh, one part of the crisis of the mainstream media today is uh, that those beasts that are regarded as you know, tangential in some way. And of course, as you point out, science cannot plausibly be considered as one of them, but is being, in the newsrooms of America, considered as one of them, are being kind of lopped off. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a real problem. And, and thank you for making us all feel even worse by raising it. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Peter Wollen is Houston. Um, I uh, uh, felt that uh, you, you did a good job of uh, apologizing for the journalistic community, but I wondered if the academic community, who you cite as one of the good guys at the beginning, um, uh, doesn't have a lot to apologize for as well. When I first heard that comment of the Bush uh, aid about we create our reality, I said, well, I could have heard that in a, uh, in a humanities tenure case or something like that. Uh, uh, how much of these ideas of uh, uh, lack of definition of truth have come from us in the academic community, or are they spontaneously generated by politicians? Oh, don't get me started. Um, <laughs> the, the notion that some sociology departments and English departments for an extended period of time educated students in the idea that everything is a text and that some of them went into journalism means that some of them frame their questions to the expert community built out of that, that as an assumption. Um, and, it, and you're hearing some of that critique resonate in Neil Newhouse. 
I mean, essentially what Neil Newhouse is saying is we're not going to let your construction of reality impinge on the reality we are going to construct. You're hearing that in the statement that is, is attributed to the Bush aide. Some people believe that was Karl Rove, but that's never been established, in which he essentially says we're going to create our own reality. And so if, if you've got a generation that came through the academy when this interesting discussion was occurring and when disciplines were in fact buying in in ways that may have some important implications when you're within the discipline studying a specific kind of text, but shouldn't infuse your discussion of policy that has actual implications in human lives, in which you have to actually make choices that will actually make differences, you know, then you've got something that's problematic that, that we as an academy, I do believe, contributed to in ways that are deeply troubling. And the chickens are coming home to roost as they pair it back to us things that appeared in our scholarly journals and other forms. sure this is on, but I'll speak loud. Erwin Shapiro from Cambridge. I wanted to say I'm very happy you got started, both of you, and I enjoyed very much. I wanted to take the conversation to revisionist history, which has not been brought up in either of your talks, but I see daily in front of my eyes, including the New York Times, the idea that we went to war in Iraq because the people who were making the decisions were misled by false intelligence. That is a complete revisionist history. But the New York Times, even in the first and the eighth column of yesterday's paper, included another sentence that I've watched over the last few months, proliferating, uh, how shall I put it, emphasizing this false, false statement that that's why we went to war in Iraq. And maybe Linda would want to comment why the New York Times is participating, and some people might even say almost leading this revisionist view of what happened. Yeah, so, you know, I've been out of the newsroom for five years, and I never ran I'm anything blame, there. So I, I don't can't, need to blame you. Uh, but, you know, and, and obviously the Times, you know um, about it. The Times record on Iraq, uh, you know, where to begin on that set of issues. So, uh, but I think, I think historical... Revisionism is a problem. I mean, in my little world, <clears throat> I often see it uh, with reference to the Robert Bork confirmation hearing uh, that, you know, Robert Bork was defeated because of uh, highly paid, unfair advertising attacks on him uh, instead of, you know, digging into what his ideas were and how the senators and the public responded to understanding those ideas during the course of the of the hearing. So um, it's a problem. I mean, nobody's born knowing anything. And again, just in my own little world, uh, law students of today weren't born at the time of the Bork hearings. And so uh, in my class, I spent a week on the Bork hearings, and I have my own little homemade video of the hearings and so on, and the transcripts. And, and I tell the students, you know, I'm not here to tell you what conclusion to draw from this, but I'm here to arm you with enough facts so that you can come to an informed opinion because this is a singular event in the history of Supreme Court nomination and confirmation that you're going to be hearing about the rest of your law careers. So thank you. Hey, I, I, well, we know that when the press speaks with what amounts to one voice, public opinion just comes in behind it. And the press managed to speak with all but one voice before going into that war in Iraq. And Judith Miller and the New York Times helped ease the process of making that case in ways that suggest that journalism failed the country dramatically by not holding leaders accountable for inconsistencies in their statements, which suggested that at least if they thought they knew something, it wasn't in common. And that perhaps if one had been careful about reading the record across the quotations leading up to that war, we might have stepped back and given more coverage of Robert Byrd and Edward Kennedy, who are standing up trying to make the alternative case. But by what it features, those two voices were downplayed, and but by how it assembles the evidence, becoming essentially an administration mouthpiece through the New York Times to make the case, journalism, I think, perpetrated a grave injustice against the American people. And I think what it says, the importance of the journalistic function in this country cannot be underestimated.
Because when it communicates a consensus, and it's the, the best consensus we have, it's performing a useful function. When it telegraphs a false consensus, a consensus we shouldn't yet have, I think it can lead us into very undesirable policy options. I would use Iraq as an example. We have time for one more question. Um, where was it? Back, no, okay, right. Uh, yes, Christine Russell, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, just going back to two of the questions about science and also about uh, the academic institutions. Uh, having been a science writer for decades, uh, I think there's a concern not just about the facts, but obviously the context, as mentioned, with climate change, evolution, almost all of the debates that we have. So. One question would be the responsibility of the professional organizations, the academic organizations, to provide some of these consensus statements that journalists who are not fully informed could refer to, such as uh, the National Academy on Climate Change and so forth. And so I think there's been a reluctance to have those kinds of consensus statements from the professional organizations, particularly in matters of controversy. So I know that Kathleen talked about consensus and context, and I'm just wondering how um, there could be a better link between uh, getting some of the academic or scientific uh, consensus translated in a way that journalists could use, and also going beyond mainstream media to social media and other forms that are actually influencing the debates on controversy right now. Yeah, I'll just say, I mean, that, that's, your point's very well taken, and I, I, I track the reproductive medicine area very closely, and I see this coming about, actually, um, in, in reproductive medicine. Uh, the main organizations trying to get out there through their websites and otherwise to provide uh, fact-based, evidence-based statements on the, some of these controversies. Uh, but, you know, whether... Uh, other organizations have the imagination or the resources or the felt need to do that. I think I, I think they should take that as a model. I think the the emergence of the Campbell and the Cochrane collaborations are, are, are a very hopeful sign because if, if the scholarly community starts to say, "Here's what we know and how we know it," and gets it into a form that can be translated to the journalists who are expert in their beat, if we still have a beat structure in these areas, the possibility of translating it to the public and holding people accountable for statements that clearly you know, violate that kind of a consensus. That is asking where is the evidence that is on each side is far more likely. Well, I'm here to invite you uh, to lunch. I know people have to leave uh, to get down to DC. So uh, thank you very much. Uh -huh.